Uh, tonight I want to speak about cultivating presence. Any, any kind of Buddhist meditation is based on the teachings of the Buddha. And the teachings of the Buddha are recorded in, in Pali Sutta, or in Sanskrit Sutra. Uh, the, these are the, the memorized discourses. So any kind of method, meditation method that claims to be Buddhist should be able to trace its lineage back to one or more of these sutras. And there are two sutras in particular in which the Buddha um, speaks about meditation. Well, he speaks about meditation a lot, but there are two sutras specifically on meditation which are quite central. One is Anapanasati Sutta, the discourse on in and out breathing, and the other is Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on the applications of mindfulness. And it's this second one which is the basis for what we're doing. So this morning when we talked about mindfulness and clear understanding, I read out a section from the sutra. Here, I'd just like to have a quick look at the opening and the closing sections of the Satipatthana Sutta, just to get a sense of what the project is about. The um, discourse begins, This is how I heard it. Once the Blessed One was living among the Kurus at the market town of Kamma Sadamma. The Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus. Bhikkhus, Bhante, they replied. The Blessed One said, This way, the four domains of mindfulness, is for the one purpose of purifying beings, overcoming sorrow and lamentation, destroying pain and grief, attaining the right path, and realizing Nibbana. What are the four? Here a bhikkhu, surrendering desire and grief for the world, lives contemplating body as body, ardent, mindful, and clearly understanding. Surrendering desire and grief for the world, he lives contemplating feeling as feeling, ardent, mindful, and clearly understanding. Surrendering desire and grief for the world, he lives contemplating mind as mind, ardent, mindful, and clearly understanding. Surrendering desire and grief for the world, he lives contemplating phenomena as phenomena, ardent, mindful, and clearly understanding. So, this is the opening section of the sutra where the, the Buddha basically lays out the, the basic instruction. It begins, this is how I heard it. Uh, these are the famous opening words of all of the sutras. Evang me suttang, usually translated, thus have I heard. But the hearing bit is important. The reason why the, the sutras are so repetitious is because they were never written down. They were never meant to be read. They are products of an oral culture and they are chants. They're performances. And so, of course, they have a lot of repetition, just like song has a lot of repetition. And so people trying to read them usually find that they have a hard time. Uh, they can be incredibly tedious to read, but they're meant to be performed, they're meant to be chanted. Here is how I heard it. The I here is the audience of the original teaching. It was first spoken by the Buddha, and then someone heard it, who in turn performed it, and somebody else heard it, and they performed it, and somebody else heard it, and they performed it, and somebody else heard it, and so on down through the centuries until Tonight we're performing it. For, for the Buddha and his students, understanding or knowledge comes through the ear, not through the eye. For us it comes through the eye, we stare at screens. But in those days, they listened to the human voice. And often what they were listening to was song. It's through song that uh, information is passed. This is how I heard it. Once the Blessed One was living among the Kurus at the market town of Kamma Sadamma. The Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus. Now, bhikkhu he, a bhikkhu is a monk, a fully ordained monk. A fully ordained nun is a bhikkhuni. So this particular discourse is addressed to the, the monks, and most of them are. This does not mean that they're not addressed to us. First of all, the Buddha lived in a patriarchal, hierarchical society. So when he was addressing a mixed audience, he would also always address the, 
the person or the group who are at the top of the hierarchy in that particular group. So if he was addressing lay people and the king was there, he would, the, the discourse would be addressed to the king. If he was talking to lay people and a, you know, a wealthy householder was there, then, the, then it would be addressed to the wealthy householder and so on. But it meant everybody present. Secondly, and most importantly, the word bhikkhu, which literally means beggar, but can be translated as monk, has two quite distinct meanings, vinaya meaning and sutra meaning. Vinaya means the, mon the monastic discipline, the rules. And these rules are relevant for monks and nuns. They're not relevant for us as lay people. So the meaning of bhikkhu in terms of vinaya is a monk or a nun. But in sutra, the meaning of bhikkhu or bhikkhuni is any serious practitioner. So anyone genuinely committed to the practice is a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni in sutra meaning. So this, by bhikkhu here, really the Buddha is saying practitioners, all practitioners, ordained, not ordained, male, female, everybody. So this discourse is addressed to us. And he says, this way, the four domains of mindfulness is for the one purpose of purifying beings, overcoming sorrow and lamentation, destroying pain and grief, attaining the right path and realizing Nibbana. He begins with purpose. This is for the, uh, the one purpose. This way is for the one purpose. And he lays out a series of graded developments uh, from the purification of the mind through to Nibbana, or in Sanskrit, Nirvana, which is the ultimate goal of Buddhist practice. And this expression, this, is, this way is for the one purpose. In Pali, the, the, the term is ayang ekayano mago. This ayang mago path, which is ekayana. Ekayana means literally one direction. So it's variously translated. You could translate it this way. This path has one direction. It's heading this way, towards, towards Nibbana. Or you could translate it in terms of purpose. It's for the single purpose, the one purpose of the liberation of, of the mind, of the heart. So the Buddha is quite explicit about what this is for. It's for the liberation of the heart. It's for attaining what he called Nibbana, or in Sanskrit, Nirvana. But it's interesting that he begins with purpose, because that's where we all begin. I'm endlessly fascinated by the question, why, when I turn up to teach a retreat, there are people here who want to do it. I mean, what are you doing here? What is it you want? We all want something. You know, we came here because there's something that we want. We have some purpose in mind. What is that purpose? What is it? What brings us here? What, what are we after? And this is really important because it is what brings us here. It is what gets us engaged with this rather bizarre activity. And it's an unusual activity. There's not so many people in Perth this weekend sitting on cushions contemplating their navels. You know, it's, it's a minority activity. So what is our purpose? And people have different purposes. It's not that there's one purpose. There's as, maybe as many purposes as there are people. Um, broadly speaking, in this culture, I think most people begin a meditation practice because for, or for reasons of physical or mental health. You know, meditation has now been scientifically proved to be good for us. And if the, the charts are on the wall and the, the studies are in and there's no doubt about it. And so often this is what draws people in, particularly emotional well-being is a preoccupation with you know, the Australian middle class who are the people who, who turn up here. So not many people come to a meditation retreat because they actually want to get enlightened. 
probably, I suspect, a minority of people sitting in this room are sitting in this room because they actually seriously want to get enlightened, whatever that means. And the other problem is, of course, we actually don't know what that means. I mean, we've got some ideas, but they're just ideas. Purpose or motivation is, is quite interesting. But all of us are motivated enough to start moving along a path in a certain direction. And it's this direction, I think, which is the most important aspect. This practice takes us somewhere. And we, can't, we don't actually know where, because we're not there yet. But it's taking us somewhere. And we have a sense that, that wherever it is, it's better than where we are now. Or at least it's a desirable place to go to. We have a sense of, of, of direction and movement. And the purpose that we have develops over time. Purpose is not something which is fixed. It's something which changes and matures over a period of time. We begin with one purpose and then years later might suddenly realise, well, come to think of it, it's changed. I, I know when I started meditation, I, would, I didn't, at the time I hadn't read this saying of Freud, but I think I, I would have agreed with him that I just wanted to move from neurotic misery to normal unhappiness. You know, I, I would, have, would have been quite happy for you know, just plain, normal, everyday unhappiness. And, and that's what got me going. And then years later I realised, wait a minute, normal unhappiness isn't good enough. <laughs> there's something more. There's, there's, there's further to go. There's something more that, that, that attracts me, that, that pulls me forward. Uh, and so it goes on. It's, a, it's an ongoing, deepening process. These days, if somebody asked me, I'd say, well, yeah, I'll, I'm going for enlightenment. But I'm not entirely sure what that means. I have a sense that it's an, it's an enormous project, and that it's a project which, isn't, which would take longer than this lifetime. So I guess it's a way of saying, well, I'm in it for the duration. There, there's there's a, this ongoing development, and I can see that it has endless possibilities. And I just want to keep going with it to, to, see, to see where it goes. So it's interesting to start with this whole issue of, of, of purpose. What, what are we doing here? What are we looking for? And the Buddha says, well, what it's about is nibbana, or in Sanskrit, nirvana. So maybe we should just briefly get a, consider what this is or what this might be. And of course, this is one of the most mysterious topics in Buddhist teachings, and one of the most obscure and esoteric. And every, all the different schools, all the different spiritual schools have different opinions about what it might be or how you might tell whether you've got it uh, or not. I find it fascinating the number of fully enlightened people there are cruising around these days. The number of enlightened teachers that seems to be increasing <coughs> every year. But I, I often wonder, what do they mean by enlightened? What, what is that? Uh, what, what are they actually claiming? Here, if we talk about Nibbana, it's difficult to talk about because it's so outside the boundaries of normal human experience. The Buddha, speak, when he speaks about it, which isn't very much, he <coughs> talks about it in terms, he uses image, metaphor, poetry, to, to talk about it. Sometimes he talks about it in terms of the going out of a fire. And this is quite an interesting image. If we think about a fire, first of all, what is, how do we define a fire? Well, how, how do we say what kind of fire it is? Um, or what fire this is? Or what fire that is? Well, a fire is defined by its fuel, what feeds it. If a fire is burning wood, then we say it's a wood fire. If it's burning the bush, then we say it's a bush fire. If it's burning gas, then we say it's a gas fire. The identity of a fire comes from its fuel. What is it that limits a fire? What is it that prevents a fire 
moving somewhere else. Again, it's its fuel, what feeds it. A fire is limited by its fuel. It can't go somewhere where there's no fuel. What does a fire cling to? If you, when you strike a match and look at, the, look at the flame, it's like the flame is dancing away, but it's like it's holding on to the match, clinging to it for dear life, which it is, because when there's no more match, there's no more fire. The, the Buddha talks about this, the relationship between fire and fuel. And in Pali, of course, there's a pun, which we miss in English. In Pali, the word for fuel is upadana. And the word for clinging or attachment is upadana. If you listen to Buddhist teachings for any, any <coughs> length of time, you hear about clinging and attachment as being a no-no. It's not good to cling. It's not good to be attached. And we have to be, get rid of our attachments and so on and so forth. The basic image that the Buddha is putting out here is an attachment or a clinging is something which feeds a process. What it feeds a fire. Now a fire is hot and, and restless. A fire is always moving and it's burning. And the Buddha is saying, we are on fire. We are burning. We're hot. Hot with fears, desires, frustrations, ambitions, and so on and so forth. So we're burning up. And we're restless. Never still. Always moving, trying to, you know, grabbing this, pushing away that. Trying to organise the other. And so on and so forth. When we come in to start meditating, sit down and be still. And we find it's incredibly difficult because we're not still. Even if the body is still inside, there's a lot of agitation going on, which is why the mind can't settle down. The mind is on fire. It's burning. We are burning. But a fire burns only as long as there's fuel, something to feed it. The fuel that, f that feeds our fires is attachment or clinging. Now, clinging has two sides to it. When the Buddha talks about desire, he, al he always obviously includes the shadow of desire, which is aversion. If I want this, I don't want that. If there's one, there's the other. If there's an aversion, there's a desire. If there's a desire, there's an aversion. If I want it to be warm, I don't like the cold. If I want it to be cooler, I don't want the heat. If there's one, there's the other. So desire has a very broad meaning. It's the way that we are pushed around by what we like and dislike, what we want and don't want. As long as we're being pushed around like this, then we are restless and hot. And this fire is being fed by these attachments. Also, we are defined by our attachments. We are what we cling to. I have a, a certain fixed view of who I am, which revolves around what I like and what I don't like. I like a certain lifestyle, which is why I do this job. You know, if I liked working in an office with a nice shirt, tie, regular salary, then I wouldn't be doing this job. I'd be doing something else. Our, our desires, our drives, define us. We are our drives. We construct a certain kind of life based on certain kinds of desires and aversions. And we define ourselves in terms of this life this kind of life. So, you know, I know who I am because I know what I like and what I don't like. I'm quite clear about that. We are defined by our drives. And so, when the Buddha is talking about fire, 
he's talking about something which is driven, agitated, always hanging on to something, and narrowly defined in terms of what it's hanging on to. And this is the normal human condition. What happens when the fire goes out? What happens if we stop putting fuel onto the fire? Well, eventually the fire burns, burns down and it disappears. What happens then? What happens to me when I am no longer clinging to anything, therefore no longer restricted by anything, no longer defined by anything, no longer limited by anything. What happens then? What is that? For the Buddha, it's, it's actually something, a, con a, a condition which is real, which exists, but which cannot be spoken of. Because as soon as you use words, you've got limits and definitions. But a heart which is not limited and not defined, there's nothing to say. Except to speak in poetic terms, such a person, the fires have gone out. And of course this is the awakened ones. Awakened beings, they are, they are people for whom the fires have gone out. And so there's nothing at all that they're restricted by and therefore nothing by which you can define them. And of course this is a process. The fire, a fire can be raging. If we stop putting the fuel on, it starts to die down. It's still there, but it's dying down. When we do this practice and we, what we come up against when we practice are our, are our fires, our internal fires burning. If we stop putting fuel on the first fires, they start to burn down. They start to cool down. So the practice itself is a cooling down process. We learn to simply to note, simply to be aware of these disturbances and obsessions rather than identifying with them and in identifying with them, tossing on more fuel. So a lot of the basic work that we're doing in this retreat has to do with cooling down. And it's a process, it goes on. It, it has a beginning and it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Gradually we cool down. The ultimate goal is for the fire to go out completely. But anywhere along this path, the fire is reducing, it is cooling. And we can, we can tell in our lives, it's obvious, that this is what's happening. Part of this burning we can see in the way that we normally relate to experience, which is we're constantly assessing and judging experience in terms of what is this for me? What do I get out of this? So I come to a meditation retreat. What's in it for me? You know, something as basic as there's an announcement, there's vacancies for yogi jobs. And so the thought pops up, should I put my hand up? But then the next thought pops up, but what's in it for me? You know, it's the way that we, 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 we relate to experience all the time. When we have that relationship to, it, to the experience, we are being driven by what the Buddha calls tanha, usually translated craving. Literally it means thirst. All of us suffer from this unquenchable thirst. It's like at the core of our being there's, 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 a, there's a black hole. And we keep grabbing onto things to throw into that hole, to fill it up, so that we, we feel okay. But we never actually succeed. We still, it doesn't matter how much we, we get, what we do, there's still that sense of dissatisfaction, of not good enough. Yet. And so we're constantly struggling to get something in order to, to satisfy ourselves. This is thirst or craving. And it too has this restless quality to it 
and a constant manipulation of experience, a constant judging and manipulating of experience. Is this going to do the job? Is this what I have to get? Is, is this what I have to grab onto? In this practice, what we're doing is training ourselves to cease that relationship. We're training ourselves to experience what happens simply as what happens. It's just what it is. Without judging it, without imposing on it, without manipulating it, just this is what it is. As we do this and as the practice matures, we begin to get a sense of what it might be to live without this sense of chronic anxiety and interference. The Buddha, in, later on in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha describes this as living independently without clinging to anything in the world. Living independently, being free, in other words. So the key value underlying the Buddha's project is freedom. And what prevents freedom is this constant disturbance, obsessive thirst, craving, clinging, attachment, wanting, based on this sense of inadequacy, that it's not good enough. What's happening now isn't good enough. I have to do something to it to make it good enough. So what we work with in our practice is precisely what the Buddha calls craving and attachment. We sit down with the, with the intention of being at ease in the body and the mind. We discover that we can't do it, that there's something getting in the way. It's the fires, they're burning. And the fires burn in the form of the, our distracting thoughts, stories, aversions, obsessions, projects, desires and so on. All the stuff that keeps bubbling up that prevents us from being at ease with this situation right now. And when we look closely we can see that underneath that there's this sense of, of driven want that drives the whole thing. And this is tanha, craving or, or thirst. If we simply watch this whole process, if we don't react but simply be present to it, in that moment of presence when we're not chasing anything and we're not pushing anything away, in that moment we are not throwing fuel onto the fire. The fire is burning, but it's burning itself out. And when the fire dies down, what emerges is Nibbana. And it's a quite, it's a natural process. At the center of the, of the practice is the cultivation, as we spoke this morning, of what the Buddha calls sati. Sati usually translated mindfulness. Sati in its normal everyday Pali meaning means memory. And it's very interesting that the Buddha takes a word that, that means memory, turns it into a technical term, and puts it at the centre of, of his whole approach to meditation. So it's interesting to see, well, what is he on about? Why is he doing this? We can see what he's on about when we look at what happens when we are distracted and how we are distracted. We're meditating away and suddenly we realise that we're not meditating and we haven't meditated for a while. We're somewhere else. We're in the middle of this distraction. In other words, the distraction begins and we don't know that it's begun. Right? This, is, this is the normal experience. I'm meditating away, suddenly I slip into, say, thought, and I don't know that I've just slipped into thought. So there's a, there's a turning point. I'm with the meditation object, and I know that I'm with the meditation object, and then suddenly 
I slip away. But I don't know that I've slipped away. So what happened at that point? Well, what happens is that suddenly I forget. I forget my meditation object. Or I f forget that I'm meditating. And so I'm distracted, but I don't know that I'm distracted. And so that goes on for a while. And then at some point, suddenly, I know I'm distracted. Now, have you ever considered what a weird thing that is? Like, why is it suddenly I know that I'm distracted? What happened? Because a moment ago, I didn't know. So why do I know now? Well, suddenly, I remember. Oh, I'm supposed to be meditating. So the opposite of awareness is forgetfulness. What we do is forget. And we do and we forget constantly. We, we're ceaselessly forgetting. We are absent-minded <laughs> in a very deep sense. Mindfulness is the act of remembering. But what we remember is not the past, but the present. We remember what is present. Ah, right now, this is what I'm doing. This is what's happening. We remember to be present. Right now, I should be staying with the meditation object. The practice of mindfulness is about remembering, but remembering the present rather than the past. Mindfulness is an action, the action of remembering, and we're training our memories. But what we're training to remember is the present, not the past. Again, we get back to this really basic thing of learning to stay present, the activity, the action of staying present with whatever is going on. The method helps. I remember years ago doing a retreat with Christopher Titmus in India. And he said, he said, I can sum up the entire instructions for the retreat in two words. Be aware. And then he added, but of course, if that's all I said, you wouldn't be very satisfied. <laughs> and of course we wouldn't be. It's so like, what? Be aware of what? How? What do you mean? What do I do here? You know, it's, we, so we need to fill in the gaps. So you, 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 you get methods and techniques and technical tr tricks and you know, if that happens, try this and blah de blah de blah de and so on it goes. But really, it's just, it's incredibly simple. It's just staying present. It's just remembering this is happening now. It's useful to always bring it back to its essential simplicity. So the, the Buddha describes the practitioner uh, who's doing this practice. Well, first of all, there are four domains of mindfulness. In Pali, the, the term is satipatthana. Sati is mindfulness. Satipatthana is a compound word which has two meanings depending on which way you read it. And it's meant to be read in both ways. The Buddha, oft, the Buddha played with words and he exploited ambiguities. In Pali you have Sati Patana, and it could be either Sati Patana or Sati Upatana. Both work. If it's Sati Patana, it refers to the domains or the foundations of mindfulness. It refers to what we are mindful of. And these are, there are four domains, body, feeling, mind, phenomena, which we'll go through later in the retreat. Sati Upatana refers to the activity of being mindful, establishing mindfulness, applying mindfulness. And it's applied in four ways, the contemplation of the body, the contemplation of feeling, the contemplation of the mind, contemplation of phenomena. Here I translate it as the domains and often you see it, the foundations of mindfulness and it's there it's translating what to be mindful of. But these four domains are basically code for all experience, everything. So the Buddha says, you know, here the monk lives contemplating body as body, 
feeling as feeling, mind as mind, phenomena as phenomena. These are the four domains. But the activity is to contemplate X as X, to contemplate this as this. So just quickly have a look at what this means. The term translated to contemplate is in Pali anupasana, which means seeing along. Pasana means seeing, and the prefix anu denotes along. So, seeing along, okay? tracking something, to track something, to follow it, to watch it over time. There's an implication of time here, to track something over a period of time. So, to spend the 40 minutes tracking the primary object in the sitting, in the walking, and so on, to spend periods of time following a particular aspect of experience. What is it doing now? What's it doing now? Checking it out. So when we track something, when we follow something, we get to know what it does. We understand its behaviour, how it moves, where it goes. Sometimes it hides and then it comes back again. Sometimes we lose it, then we find it again. So tracking, contemplating. In the first domain, contemplating body as body. Body here means all physical experience. So to contemplate body as body, what does that mean? It means to see the experience as just the experience, nothing else. Contemplating body as body. I notice that there's a strong sensation in my ankle. What would it mean to not contemplate body as body? It would be, ah, there's a painful sensation there. Oh my God, it hurts. Good Lord, this is terrible. I've got to sit here for another 30 minutes. What if I injure myself? But I'm not supposed to move. It would be embarrassing if I moved. Everybody would know if I moved. But I have to move. But I don't want to move but I've got to move soon because it's going to fall off. It's awful. I can't stand it anymore. And so on. Bloody, 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 bloody. This is not contemplating body as body. Contemplating body as body is noticing, ah, painful sensation, throbbing, heat, pressure. Contemplating mind as mind is aversion, anxiety, wanting to move. It's just, this is what's happening. It's just what it is. It's just an experience that comes and goes. Staying with experience without throwing stuff into it, without projecting into it, without making something out of it, but just this is what the experience is, that's all. This is to contemplate something as something, to track it over a period of time and just to see it exactly as it presents. Nothing added, nothing extra. So to track something as it presents is hard enough, but not putting anything extra on it, that's really hard, because that's what we do all the time. Here, a practitioner surrendering desire and grief for the world lives contemplating body as body, ardent, mindful, and clearly understanding. Surrendering desire and grief for the world. The word translated here as desire literally means leaning toward. It's a way of describing desire. We lean toward what it is that we want. So we're sitting here doing the meditation, but we find ourselves leaning towards something else. And of course, again, whenever there's desire, there's the shadow, aversion. So desire here includes, if there's desire, there's what the Buddha here calls grief the rejection of experience. Oh, I can't handle this. This is too, too bad, too terrible, too painful. Surrendering desire and grief for the world. This refers to the ongoing process of letting go of our entanglements with the world, the world of ourselves and the world outside. Thinking about the past, thinking about the future, wanting, not liking, planning, manipulating, and so on and so forth. So of course this happens, of course we, we get pulled away all the time. 
but the, the practice involves surrendering this, letting it go, just drop it, drop it, keep, keep on dropping it. So surrendering desire and grief for the world, the practitioner lives contemplating body as body. Now first of all, you notice how it begins with the body. This is the first domain. Body in the broad sense of all physical experience, everything that we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. Body in the narrow sense of tactile sensation. And body has two advantages as a meditation object. First of all, body is always now. It's always in the present. Whereas thought is ranges through past and future. And secondly, body, it's particularly body in the narrow sense of, of tactile sensation, touch, is very clear. The tradition analyzes the nature of physical experience all f uh, as all experience comes about through the sense object striking the sense organ. And the tradition says that the impact of sense object on sense organ in eye, ear, nose, tongue is like cotton striking cotton. It's relatively subtle. The impact of sense object hitting sense organ when it's touch hitting body is like a hammer striking an anvil. It's very strong and clear. And this is what makes it such a suitable meditation object. It's powerful, it's strong, it's clear, and it's always present. So we start with the body. And every time we come back to the body, we come back to the present, which is a big advantage. And to contemplate body as body is, being, is, is to be simply and radically present to physical experience without doing anything extra to it or if we're doing something extra being simply and radically present to the fact that we're doing something extra. We're practicing being present and of course as soon as we do that we start to notice how much we are absent well, being simply and radically present to the fact that we're absent. We can be present to anything, including the absence of presence. It's, again, very simple, but very sophisticated. Just being present to whatever is happening. The fires are burning, but we're just present for them. And notice the Buddha says she lives contemplating body as body. What this is getting at is making it a habit. The Buddha, when the Buddha is talking about meditation attainments, he talks about often he talk, talks about the meditator attaining something and then living or dwelling in it. To attain something means to stumble into something briefly, and we've all had that experience. You know, we're meditating away and suddenly, bingo! Ah, got it! Fantastic! So I finally got it worked out. So simple and so obvious. And so that sitting ends and the bell goes and I know that I could sit here for another hour but what the hell, I'll get up and have dinner. Come back thinking, right, this is it. Now I've got it figured out. And then we start to meditate and the mind's all over the place. You know, can't do it. This is a very common kind of experience. So it's like we attain something but we're not living there yet. It's not a new habit. But to live contemplating body as body means to make it an ongoing project. We make it our habit to stay with experience, whatever it is. She lives contemplating body as body, ardent. Now, ardent here describes or refers to the passion required to do this practice. In other words, it's, it's it refers to desire. And desire is, is very important. Again, it's like very similar to motivation. What is it that brings us here? How passionate are we about this, about, do, about this project? We need to be passionate, otherwise we wouldn't do it because it's too hard. So ardency, to be really prepared to really go for it, 
sometimes we don't feel like this at all. Sometimes we feel anything but ardent. But ardency is not really a feeling. It goes deeper than feeling. We keep coming back year after year. Even though we know it's a struggle. Even though we know, okay, when I started meditation, you know, 10 years ago, I had all these ideas that all this would happen, but it hasn't happened yet. But still, I keep coming back. Give it another bash. Try again. Well, what's driving that? It's ardency. I might not be feeling all that ardent, but it's obviously there because otherwise I wouldn't keep slogging away. So ardency goes deeper than a feeling. Sometimes the Buddha talks about Dhamma Raga, Dhamma Nandi. Raga is usually tra sometimes translated lust, so sometimes translated passion. Here, it, lust doesn't quite fit because it's Dharma lust, lust for the Dharma. It doesn't quite work, does it? <laughs> but passion, da passion for the Dharma. The Dharma here it means that which is true, that which is real, uh, that which is ultimately valuable. Uh, to have a passion for that. And Nandi means delight. Delight is the satisfaction that comes from experiencing it. Passion for what is real, what is true, and delight in it when we, when we get there, when we, have, have, when, we, when we touch upon that. We might do a retreat, for example, and have moments when it, we feel whatever, whatever this is, whatever this experience is, it's, at least it's real. It's not just the usual superficial bloody, bloody, bloody. It's this, at least it's real. And there's a delight in that. It might be incredibly simple. You know, it might be just sitting in the, on, a, on a seat in the garden looking at the tree or just walking down a corridor, mm -hmm. but, re but really just walking down a corridor. And there's a delight in it. This is Dhamma Nandi, the delight in the Dharma. And it's this passion and delight which takes us along this path, the satisfaction that comes from doing this. So she lives contemplating body as body, ardent, mindful and clearly understanding. And we talked this morning about mindfulness and clear understanding. Mindfulness essentially is presence. Clear understanding is the intelligence associated with presence. We stay present and we develop a wisdom and understanding. But part of the deal is to stay intelligently present. It involves bringing intelligence to our practice of presence. So learning how to do it, in other words. It's important that we don't just as meditation students, don't simply faithfully and loyally obey orders. Although not in my experience, med Australian meditators don't do that very much anyway. <laughs> but still, uh, so, you know, often we have this attitude that, okay, here's the method, and I just have to mechanically reproduce it. Meditation is a skill. It's a very s subtle and sophisticated skill, and we can only learn it if we start to take responsibility for what we're doing. And so being intelligently present is in part to, to really be monitoring, well, what's going on? How's it working? How is it not working? That was a good sitting. What characterised that one? What was I doing then? That was a bad sitting. Well, what was going on there? And what can I do about that? And so on. It's like developing a skill learning that balance of the body and the mind. And it comes with time, but it's not just reproducing someone else's instruction, something from outside, but making a discovery within ourselves of, you know, how does it work? What's going on? So this is um, the Buddha's opening instructions in the discourse. And then he ends the discourse. The, 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 the sutra goes on for quite a while and we won't get through it in one week. But I just want to skip to the end because I find it quite interesting. One of the, one of the questions that 
often arises among the meditators is how long does it take? It's a very pragmatic question. After all, I'm quite busy. I've managed to get a week off work, which is quite an accomplishment. And um, I'm in a hurry, thank you very much. I haven't got time to waste. I'm, I'm not going to retire into a monastery and spend the next 30 years doing this. I want results and I want them reasonably quickly. After all, I've given up the opportunity to go to an enlightenment weekend. I'm spending a whole week here. So how long does it take? When do I get the result? And the Buddha rarely, very, very rarely, addresses this kind of issue. But in Satipatthana Sutta, he does, at the end of it, he raises the question and answers it. So I'd just like to go through his answer to this question. He says, Truly, whoever practices these four domains of mindfulness like this for seven years can expect one of two results, either perfect insight here and now, or if a touch of clinging remains, the state of non-return. Perfect insight here and now means full enlightenment, or if a touch of clinging remains, that's the state of non-return, that's the third stage of, en of enlightenment. So it only takes seven years. And then he says, forget about seven years. Whoever practices these four domains of mindfulness like this for six years can expect one of two results. Either perfect insight here and now, or if a touch of clinging remains, the state of non-return. Forget about six years. Whoever practices these four domains of mindfulness like this for five years, four years, three years, two years, one year, can expect one of two results. Either perfect insight here and now, or if a touch of clinging remains, the state of non-return. Forget about one year. Whoever practices these four domains of mindfulness like this for seven months, six months, five months, two weeks, can expect one of two results, either perfect insight here and now, or if a touch of clinging remains, the state of non-return. Forget about two weeks. Whoever practices these four domains of mindfulness like this for seven days, can expect one of two results. Either perfect in insight here and now, or if a touch of clinging remains, the state of non-return. This is why it is said, this way, the four domains of mindfulness, is for the one purpose of purifying beings, overcoming sorrow and lamentation, destroying pain and grief, attaining the right path, and realizing Nibbana. So, the Buddha begins the bidding at seven years, and then progressively reduces it to seven days. And you get the feeling that he could have kept going down. The number seven is very interesting. It's symbolic of completion. Uh, seven indicates a complete cycle. You notice how he goes from seven years down to one year and then begins at seven months, not 11 months, which you, you would expect. Because again, seven, it's a complete cycle. So a complete cycle of years, a complete cycle of months, a complete cycle of days. But you get the sense that he could have gone from seven days down to seven minutes, and from seven minutes down to seven seconds. Whoever practices these four domains of mindfulness like this for seven seconds. Is there anyone here who has been, can guarantee they've been continuously mindful for seven seconds with no break? It's quite a powerful experience if you can do it for seven seconds much less for seven minutes, much less for seven hours, much less seven days. It's extraordinarily powerful. But getting back to the question of time, I think what the Buddha is saying here is that time is not the issue. We think in terms of time. We calculate in terms of time. And we miss the point. It's not a question of time. It's a question of, of intimacy of being intimate with the experience as it is right now. Time is just a concept that we project onto experience in order to separate ourselves from intimacy. When I'm sitting here thinking of the clock, am I intimate with the experience? No. When I'm intimate with the experience, do I have any conception of how long this is lasting. 
No, I don't. I'm just with it. <coughs> it's not a question of time. It's a question of intimacy. It's a, que- it's a question of being intimate with this experience right now. It's very easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. It's astonishing how much energy we spend resisting what's going on right now. But when we get a taste of it, when we get a taste of what it means to be intimate with present experience, that's when we get that nandi, that delight. And we recognise that this is something worth developing. This is something worth cultivating. And we realise, of course, that what we are present to is not the issue. What's important is presence. We use the method, we train ourselves to be present to certain aspects of experience, the breathing, the walking, and so on. But fundamentally, that's not what it's about. What it's about is simply being present to whatever is happening right now. Okay, and that's more than enough for tonight. So thank you.